I'd like to just just begin this particular discussion just to uh, bring uh, people back to the events of Bloody Sunday. Uh, this particular panel discussion is one of several that the Bloody Sunday March Committee is organizing this particular week. Uh, when we originally planned these events, we'd hoped that they would be in person, uh, face to face, but because of COVID, uh, I think, and various other uh, pressures and stuff uh, related to the guidelines, we decided to move events online. So I want to begin this event tonight, as we are doing with all of our events, by uh, <clears throat> listing the names of the dead, those people who were killed on Bloody Sunday, and following that with a minute's silence. And then uh, Mick will uh, start uh, by introducing the first speaker. So in memory of Jackie Duddy, James Ray, Gerald Donaghy, Michael McDade, Bernard McGuigan, Hugh Gilmore, Gerard McKinney, John Young, Patrick Doherty, William Nash, Kevin McElhinney, Michael Kelly, William McKinney, and John Johnson. And I'd ask just for a minute of silence now. Thank you. Um, I'll pass things over now to Mick Fealty, uh, who's our chair for tonight. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, and thanks for everyone for uh, coming along tonight. Um, I'm sure everybody, I know I have almost had a fill of uh, Zoom and meeting people in, not in person, and it's, uh, but nevertheless, it's an important uh, discussion is an important event, and I have to say I'm truly honoured uh, to be asked to to chair it. Um, for those who don't know, uh, my name is Mick Fealty. I run. I'm the editor of a website called Slugger O'Toole, which not many people know, but started about 20 years ago as a research uh, resource for a project that I was doing on the future of unionism in Northern Ireland. Believe it or not on the basis that the Good Friday Agreement was only five years old. Unionism seemed to be very underconfident. And not being a unionist, I was very curious about what, uh, what was stopping it from engaging with the new power sharing, um, uh, new power sharing institutions in Stormont. Um, and it was pretty much a passive resource until we started publishing some of the long interviews that we did. And then a conversation, after seven months of existence started roughly in February 2003 and it hasn't really stopped since. And what's interesting about that, I think, uh, and what's maybe relevant to this conversation is that er possibly because I started looking at unionism, it brought unionists into the conversation. But I would say the dominant, the dominant converse, uh, conversationalists are probably on the nationalist side. So uh, we have a, a a fitfully successful conversational space. And for me, conversations are really important. Of course, actions are important, but conversations are the things that beget ideas and ideas are the things that beget change. Uh, and, you know, all of us, I think, in a, in a fast moving world, uh, and certainly all the people in this room, I think, are definitely interested in uh, projecting some kind of a change on the future, more perhaps a more progressive one. So before I introduce um, our first speaker, who's Colin Harvey, many of you will know, uh, son of Derry, um, I just want to say a few words about how this is going to work. I, I want to give each one of the speakers uh, a fair enough time just to lay out what their thoughts are in terms of uh, a future Ireland. But as questions come to you, please don't interject or speak them out. But if you could put them in the chat box, um, one of my colleagues will uh, be ch checking through all of that because we want your responses to the speakers as they go through. And given, um, given it may be some time before we get back to, uh, to the audience to, to contribute in person, um, I'd like to be able to gather up some of your questions as we go along. 
Okay, so uh, with no further uh, delay, um, Colin Harvey is a professor of human rights uh, law at the School of Law in Queen's University. He's a fellow of the Senator uh, George Mitchell Institute for Peace, Security and Justice, an associate fellow uh, of the Institute of Irish Studies. He served as the head of uh, the law school between 2007 and 2012, and he was a commissioner on the Human Rights Commission between 2005 and 2011. I, I, know, I know Colin really from uh, Fortnite days when he was a, a regular contributor there on uh, all matters to do with human rights. He's been um, a real advocate for not just the Human Rights Act in Northern Ireland, but before that, also the uh, the All Island Charter for Human Rights, of which Colin and I could have a long conversation about why that one hasn't gone anywhere just yet. But uh, anyway, Colin, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Mick. And just to re reiterate, thank you for the invitation to, to be here this evening. Um, pleased to be able to talk to you all um, look forward to hearing your reflections and thoughts my, my thoughts this evening um, my thoughts all of this week are with the bloody Sunday families uh, this week I think it's absolutely essential what is happening that we remember what happened that we never forget what the British state did to this society before that day on that day and what it has done since that day and it's essential that we remember this evening what i want to do is reflect on the theme of the discussion which is the theme of visions for new ireland and really look forward to the conversation i'll try not to take up too much time and just sketch out some thoughts because i'm actually quite interested in hearing what what my fellow panelists have to say and what you all have to say as well. I'll of course now speak for another two hours having said that right, which is I won't, I'll give it short. Um, three themes, first is context, second is New Ireland, and third, I wanna say something about ways forward. The, the first is context or context, and we could be here all night talking in historical, political, social, cultural terms, but I, I just want to mention the B word and Obviously, there's a multiplicity of B words at the moment that we could use, but the one B word is Brexit. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt that the constitutional discussion we're engaged in tonight has accelerated really quite remarkably in a post-Brexit context. And you know, one of the things we can talk about is the reasons for that. Also, I think the political dynamics on the island of Ireland have had a major impact on this discussion too. In terms of framing the discussion and the debate, it's really striking and noticeable and understandable in many ways that the Good Friday Agreement framework is providing the framework basis, really architecture for the conversations and the debates. Really very noticeable thus far is that all participants really have to have an agreement plausible argument in terms of uh, the way this debate is going uh, forward. And I, in my view, quite quite rightly, you know, given the centrality of the right to self determination and consent in, in that document and its overwhelming endorsement and support, you'll all know in terms of context that organisation and work is ongoing, and I can't recall really uh, a time at which there was such focused work ongoing on some of the hard questions around operationalising some of this language, the scale of, I think, civic, political, institutional preparatory work that's going on, I think is wildly underappreciated. In fact, I think there'll be useful work emerging relatively soon, just making people aware how much work is ongoing. So really a context at the moment is that preparatory efforts for the referendums and visits in the Good Friday Agreement are, are very much well underway. Um, it increasingly looks to me like we're in a sort of pre-referendum phase when uh, both sides in the argument are essentially mobilizing um, in a civic and political way around this. And in fact, some of the political dynamics at the moment um, 
can be explained by the protocol, but are actually probably better explained by an awareness that this is where the conversation on the island is, is rapidly heading towards. So context for me is it's plausible, you know, and I know there's all sorts of debate about timelines and when this might happen. Um, but it's certainly plausible that we're heading towards these referendums and this is in the Good Friday Agreement in the decade ahead. Um, so the context for me and very striking context at the moment is a focus on preparing and planning for that, not in abstract theoretical or speculative terms, but in concrete terms uh, and doing the hard work in advance before these happen. Second uh, theme I would just want to highlight in terms of reflections, the title for, the, for our session this evening is Visions of a New Ireland. So it struck me in thinking about that, that the title itself is plural, Visions. Hopefully I've read it right and it's not say Visions. It's Visions for New Ireland. So there's a pluralist starting point, which suggests that uh, there's democratic debate and dialogue to be had around this question. Uh, meaning that there's not one settled view of what a new Ireland might uh, look like. So my own view is that some of the most intriguing conversations that are going to happen in the decade ahead are going to happen within constituencies rather than between constituencies. What I mean by that is that some of the most interesting discussions to come and happening at the moment are happening between those who, for example, support reunification and between those who support uh, the union with Britain. Now, my sense is tonight, and you know, make in terms of framing this discussion, it's made clear I spent my life working uh, for equality, human rights, and social justice. And like many people are joining or involved in this conversation, have been for a while, but uh, also see the transformative potential that is there. What I mean by that is that people are involved in this discussion, many people not simply because of corporate branding of New Ireland on a corporately branded poster that you sit in front of, but they take the word new and New Ireland seriously. In other words, they see this as an opportunity to promote a transformative conversation on the island of Ireland in relation to equality, rights, climate and social justice, areas where there's significant room for improvement uh, across the entire island. And I think many people are joining the discussion, many people who might have been reluctant to join this debate in the past, um, for that reason, they see the transformative potential of all this. An event on Saturday, an um, online event, again, made clear that you know, if you're using the language of a new Ireland in this constitutional debate, you better be serious, yeah? Because many people are participating because they take the new dimension of that uh, seriously and they see the transformative potential. And obviously myself and others spend a lot of time then thinking about how you design something like that. So what's been right, really quite interesting very, very early on is how many people are moving to, you know, talk about a new constitution, new arrangements, bills of rights, you know, things like that, very, very early stage. As the debate gets into more detail, however, and more people join the debate, I'd be intrigued to watch where the proposals end up in that continuity, if you like, uh, transformative uh, continuum, uh, because I'm convinced myself that that's where there'll be some some fascinating debates. Maybe we can speak a bit more about um, tonight because the sort of transformative change that some people uh, want to see will be profoundly uncomfortable for many people on both parts of the island and across the island and uh, watch that space. So question throughout Irish history really is going back to many, many periods in Irish history is which visions of a new Ireland will win out when uh, this conversation uh, develops into in the direction that, that we're talking about tonight, really, as this gets more and more real? What are the lessons from history? Um, to be candid, um, something to think about. Why do those who promote transformative change 
habit of, have a habit of losing out when it comes to putting new architecture in place? Are there any lessons from history uh, that can be learned uh, that if you want really transformative change uh, and things are going in the direction they're going, um, how do you make sure that that happens? You know, my own view on that is, um, and it, you know, this probably doesn't need to be said for the audience this evening, but too many people who believe in social change, who believe in equality, human rights, and climate justice, social justice, are still bystanders in this discussion. And in some senses, that's understandable. There's an anxiety and nervousness in parts of civil society uh, in entering this sort of constitutional space. Um, and that's real. Uh, and obviously, there are implications for doing so as well. But my view has been, as and remains, and speaking to a lot of groups north and south on the island, that you really can't be a bystander in this discussion if your objective, either north, south, or whatever, is to achieve genuine transformative uh, change in the here and now. That if you're looking for a justification for this, um, you know, we're talking about, in Good Friday Agreement terms, perfectly legitimate. I know that sometimes does, shouldn't need to be said, but it does need to be said. Per perfectly legitimate co constitutional objectives. There's a right to work for constitutional change. It would be silly not to do the necessary par preparatory work. And that preparatory work needs done in equality, human rights, climate, and social justice. Because I'll tell you this, um, the parameters of this conversation are already quietly being set. Uh, there's already much more work ongoing than I think is rea realized. Um, uh, and, um, you know, people need to engage, participate, and be involved and think about ways they can participate and be involved in these pluralist conversations about competing visions of what a new Ireland looks like. So third, just to you know, wrap up and so try and keep it brief on ways forward, I'm not now going to do a sort of you know, blueprint print, print from on high about what, you know, part of the use of the language of conversation and dialogue is it's genuinely conversational and there's a genuine dialogue. And you enter these discussions with the recognition that you may have your mind changed, you may think again, you may hear designs, proposals, and models for going forward that make you rethink your own established position. And I think that's all to the good. But to me, in terms of ways forward, this is rapidly growing and deepening. Uh, it looks very much to me like a, a pre-referendum uh, phase on this island where there's a growing recognition, even in places that would have normally been reluctant, that the island is heading towards giving people a choice. You know, it often strikes me as remarkable that people who base their philosophy of politics on the principle of consent seem to be tremendously hesitant of actually asking people the constitutional question. I think there's often the cliche in the society that we say we talk about nothing else than the constitutional question. I think that's fundamentally wrong. We don't talk about the constitutional question. We work around it. We talk around it, we talk in the abstract, we talk in theories, we talk in speculative terms. The hard work hasn't been done and hasn't been done to prepare the ground to actually ask people the constitutional question and let them know what the consequences of, are of, 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 of answering that or whatever way they choose to answer that. I think the signal for me increasingly is in, in my own world, um, Colin Harvey, so-called academic at Queen's these days, I have to preface that with, is uh, that the significant amounts of funding that are being provided for universities and others to do the necessary preparatory research. And now universities across this island and actually across these islands are falling over each other to initiate projects to look at precisely this question. And to me, that's always a sort of tacit signal that uh, something is on the move that there's traction around these things. You know, keep in mind, sometimes governments might jump up and down and say they want something to happen or they want but preparatory work, but it's often notable who's actually funding some of these projects that, that are going forward at the moment. Um, and I have a sense that when the universities and other institutions are beginning to do the scale and depth of work that they're doing, that something's happening. 
There's also been tremendous civic leadership around this issue, and I don't need to tell anybody in this room, in this virtual room, that you know, the peace process, everything else, it's civic society leads, um, politicians, governments, they'll catch up eventually. Uh, as I've said before, they'll catch up, they'll take over, they'll take it on, they'll claim it for themselves that it was their idea, and they'll exclude all us from the conversation, right? So, uh, but civic leadership really is leading the way at the moment. Um, and the politics will eventually catch up, I think, with that. In terms of ways forward, I think thinking now specifically around the reunification question, um, I don't think there's any need to promote some kind of false uniformity of view about the future because there isn't one in any democratic pluralist space. There's a multiplicity of views about the future and there's different uh, visions uh, to use the language of tonight. But really any campaign that's going to stand any chance of success on the island of Ireland is going to need to be a broadly based, primarily civic led campaign working for constitutional change. And I know an organization that I'm involved in working for and on the management board of Declare an Interest Ireland's Future is working very, very hard to build that sort of broadly based civic coalition to work and for and prepare the ground for constitutional change. So without in any way undervaluing or undermining legitimate differences of views about the past, present and future, um, look, there's an absolute necessity for collaboration, for coalitions, for alliances to be built, uh, for the work to be put in to allow that to happen, to bring surprising, perhaps surprising voices into this discussion as well, to find ways to, yes, acknowledge legitimate differences. There's no point trying to project a false monolithic view on any constitutional debate like this. But if you're working for the reunification of Ireland, it's important to work together on a common objective without necessarily abandoning uh, existing commitments or starting points. And I think if there's one theme tonight, I really would like to underline, it's that need to find ways to work productively together in coalitions, alliance building and collaboration to work on what ultimately is a common objective. The premise for what I'm saying this evening is that if you believe in reunification of Ireland, uh, that objective has never looked closer than it looks today. Um, I think okay. it's close and it's nearly there. And just to end, it makes little sense to me in the current context to be a bystander in current civic movements for peaceful and democratic constitutional social change. So really tonight, um, this is happening. It's real. The island is on a clear pathway towards the referendums and the Good Friday Agreement taking place. And I would really urge people this evening listening uh, to join in, get involved uh, in this really growing movement for constitutional social change. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Colin. And some remarks there in the chat uh, from Jim Key and he liked the openness of your uh, framing. Uh, and the underscoring of the danger of a, a power over solution being sold to the base to foreclose a, for, uh, a transformative power uh, with vision emerging from below. Um, thanks for that, Jim. And there's some, I think, a sympathetic point made by Angela talking about some of the pressure you've had uh, just for coming out and advocating. And I think that that's an important point. Uh, I mean, in the sense that when we talk about pluralism and plur pluralistic spaces, um, we're not quite in that space yet, uh, certainly not in the North. Um, but now we're going to go on to uh, an important Southern voice, Claire Daly, MP, sorry, MEP, sorry, Claire, nearly changed your nationality there, <laughs> who uh, won her uh, election in the Dublin constituency in very exciting terms. Uh, when transfers are going all over the place, I remember. Uh, I don't know if it was late at night, but it was certainly certainly better than 
better than watching the Grand National anyway. Um, but Claire's all re- already prior to that was a TD came in in the what you might say was a transformative moment that election of 2011 in the Republic when uh, a, a Fianna Fáil Green led government was cashiered in no uncertain terms and Claire came in. Uh, and who, along with Mick Wallace, is part of Independence for Change, uh, well known as a passionate speaker. Claire, I know you've got your own agenda there to speak to, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting about what um, Colin said was um, this idea that those who advocate tra- for transformative change often lo- lose out in the normal business of politics. And I'm not asking you to, to address that directly, but but if, if there's some way in which you could pick that up as a as a loose football, so to speak, um, that'd be great. Claire Daly. Thanks very much, Michael. And you don't uh, give me an easy start to that. I could keep you here all night talking about the European Union, Russia, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe I'll, I'll restrain my remarks until the end on, on your question. Look at... I'm absolutely delighted to, hear, to be here and thanks so much for inviting me. I have to say I'm really looking forward to seeing people in the flesh on Sunday at the march and, uh, you know, in many ways the most fitting tribute we can give to the victims of Bloody Sunday is to continue their struggle for a better Ireland. So in that sense, I'm really glad to be part of the conversation and I agree with your remarks Michael that you know exchange of views and conversation is where it's at and the older I get the more I know that I don't have the answers but maybe the best contribution I can make is to ask the questions so look at I mean I suppose we could start by saying that for some people in New Ireland is synonymous with the United Ireland it's almost taken for granted that that would be the case, particularly if you maybe come from a Catholic background in the north or maybe from the south. And I suppose my first question would be, well, is that the end game? And if it is, is it enough to truly deliver a new Ireland? And I mean, I absolutely agree with a lot of the points that Colin made. We are absolutely moving in the direction of where the questions are going to be put not because necessarily there's a huge developed opinion or a positive action around the need for a united ireland but probably in some ways because of brexit because it has left the misnamed united kingdom looking not very united at all Uh, it's clearly given uh, a fresh impetus to a new scottish referendum it's also i think made the issue of the need to preserve the all island nature of the economy on the island of Ireland without any border clear to many people in a way in which maybe it hadn't been clear before. Now, that's not to take from the, you know, the supply problems or the increased costs post Brexit, which has been blamed on the protocol. I think a lot of that stuff will settle down. It was inevitable. It's not to take away from the resistance, I suppose, that was shown up and the reaction of certain sections of the Protestant population. But in some ways, that reaction wasn't, I suppose, a confident worked out strategy. It was more of a sort of a a lashing out, I felt. That's not just over. I suppose the point I'm making is I don't think we should overstate that. What was most um, dominant post-Brexit, I think, was the a space emerging for people who never really had any affinity or thought of the idea of a united Ireland suddenly beginning to look at that. I mean, we saw a section of the Protestant middle class who previously had no problem at all with being linked to Britain, elements of the Catholic middle class who really were agnostic on a united Ireland suddenly post Brexit being kind of jolted into having to think about these things. Um, you know, I think, and meanwhile, in the south of Ireland, the idea of a united Ireland, well, you know, I'd say, and obviously it's only my opinion, that's only valid as that, but I'd say that there is a majority support for the idea of a united Ireland, but it's probably on the level of an aspiration, an affinity, rather than a sort of a goal that you go out there to fight for, or rather than something that's seen as an urgent necessity. So I suppose what I'm saying is that if the, and when, because I agree with Colin, it's not a question of if, but when the question is put, will that sentiment in the South 
be enough to deliver a yes vote. I mean, in the heat of a campaign, for example, when the issues would be posed about, well, how much is this going to cost us if there was a united Ireland? And I mean, we can certainly point to the fact that there are economic benefits in a united Ireland, but you can't get away from the fact of the British sub subvention in the northern states. You even look at things like the health service in the north, which I'm sure everybody in the north would give out hell about. It's been, you know, uh, undermined like the NHS has been everywhere, but it looks like a jewel by comparison to the basket case that we have in the south of Ireland and so on. So these issues would be uh, an issue, I suppose, when the question is put. But then you'd have to say, well, who would be the people making that call saying, well, how much is this going to cost us? Um, and it probably, that backlash would probably come from elements in the north who might want to maintain a link with Britain, also those in Britain who, you know, wouldn't want to lose the prestige of the breakup of the, of the so-called uh, UK. And clearly these aren't necessarily the most influential people with the Southern audience. So I think in looking at what's the mentality in the South, I would agree that there's been a huge change. Um, if you need proof of that, you only need to look and listen to the comments of Leo Bradker eight months ago at the Fine Gael Ordesh. Now, this is the party conference of the party that's the inheritors of blue shirts. And Leo told that conference eight months ago that he believes the United Ireland is could happen in his lifetime. He believes Sinn Féin, or Sinn Féin, Fine Gael should set up a branch in the north of Ireland. And he believes, and this is a quote, that we should be proud to say that unification is something that we in fin Fine Gael aspire to and part of our mission to work towards. Now, who would have thought it? What can I say? Um, if you want a, uh, an indication of a shift, that's it, because we all know that politicians don't lead, they follow. And Leo is following a mood that's out there. Uh, I think he's also trying to muscle in on a bit of Sinn Féin turf. And I think the Sinn Féin uh, position is a factor in this discussion at the moment because obviously they would move to exercise a border control and so on, a border and um, poll, but Sinn Féin are the biggest party in the north, the demographics are moving in their favour, and the probability is that they will be in the government in the south, they are most definitely the most popular party and rising. Um, and I suppose the first point I would make is that that popularity to me is not because they, it reflects a desire for a united Ireland, but I think it's because people in the South are fed up with the status quo. They've been betrayed by the two civil war parties who for years have pretended to be different and have demonstrated their inability to deliver on the needs for ordinary people. So I don't think the support for Sinn Féin is harking back to a reimagined past of an all-Ireland economy before partition or anything like that. I think it actually is about the future and a new future, a future where the problems facing ordinary people might finally be dealt with. The chronic housing problems that exist, whereby people even on decent jobs can't afford to buy a house, where rents are off the Richter scale, homelessness is rampant, and we've allowed our economy to be taken over by vulture funds, where we see the health crisis in the South, where the pandemic and COVID meant we basically had to shut down our health service for cancer treatment, for mental health problems and so on, because we couldn't have coped with a splurge from uh, the COVID pandemic. Short-term contracts, the gig economy, the lopsided development of Ireland concentrated around Dublin and all the other areas neglected. The challenge of climate change that Colin um, mentioned. All of these things are the reasons why people are looking for Sinn Féin. It's an idea about a new Ireland, I think. So from that point of view, the idea of just adding the two halves, if you like, of North and South and carrying on isn't going to cut it when we talk about a new Ireland. And what is really necessary is the idea of a radical reorganization of society. And for me, James Connolly's words were never truer that if you just remove the um, English army tomorrow and host the green flag over Dublin Castle, unless you set about the organization of the Socialist Republic, 
your efforts will be in vain because England will still rule you. And I think that still is true to form, although we could add on to England, the United States, because the south of Ireland has prostrated itself to foreign direct investment and US multinationals in particular. We portray ourselves, we are a, a tax haven. We've opened up the vulture funds to come in and buy up our housing stock. On a daily basis, we allow US troops transit through Shannon. And we have the ama amazing backlash at the moment over Russian maneuvers off the Irish coast, which as a pacifist and an anti-war activist, I disagree with, but it's a little bit ironic that this is getting focused on when there's so much transit of US troops every day. So I think a new Ireland has to tackle all of these things if it's going to deliver for people who um, want and look to Sinn Féin at the moment. And I suppose without going on too long, uh, I mean, if you had a risen people who were behind a government demanding ownerships of the resources of the country, well, that's immediately going to bring you into conflict with the EU. And I don't want to go too much on that cul-de-sac from here in my base in, in Brussels, but you know, we have an irony here where one of the, the changes, Brexit, which has tipped the balance in favor of a united Ireland, or at least of the question being put, is because of a desire to stay within the EU. Uh, and I mean, I, in that sense, there's a certain truth in the goading or the wooing of certain sections of the Republican movement by the likes of Nigel Farage and the Brexit party, and even the Irexit party that they say, look at for years you've been fighting the Brits and now you're just gonna roll over and hand over Ireland to the Europeans. You know, for God's sake, are you just destined to servility forever? And, you know, there's a certain point in that because the EU is presented as a guardian of progress and democracy and fundamental rights. But that's a bit of an a la carte because the EU is very good about lecturing other people about fundamental rights, but they don't really do that with the, their own. And the truth is that the EU is a neoliberal project run in the interests of big business, big agri, big pharma, the multi uh, and military industrial complex and fiscal restraint and the straitjacket of that is built into it. We know that from austerity, the fact that the Ireland was landed with the, the debts of German uh, bondholders and so on. Austerity is now a banned word in the EU. We're not allowed to use it, but the policies are still there. They've learned the lesson a little bit with the COVID recovery package where some of that has been given in the form of loans, but actually there'll be a payback on that. So my point is a new Ireland is gonna to have to break with neoliberalism. It's not just a question of leave or remain with the EU. If we were to leave now, we'd probably have to re reunite with the UK in some format. But if we stay, there is going to be a straitjacket in terms of economic policies that would allow us to help our people. And I think in that sense, our future lies with others across Europe and beyond. Um, we have to challenge the power of global capitalism of the military industrial complex that dominates the planet. I mean, I'd like to see United Ireland. I'm pro-European, but I actually hate the EU. I really, really hate it. And the more I see of it, the more I hate of it. Um, because I stand for solidarity across nations in Europe and beyond. And I think a new Ireland has to be rooted in the internationalism of Connolly. And our starting point in that has to be that we live in dangerous times where NATO is predominating and destabilizing. So the vision for a new Ireland has to be first and foremost against imperialism and standing with the oppressed everywhere standing against sanctions, against regime change, and defending our neutrality, which does mean speaking up for the use of Shannon Airport or against the use of Shannon Airport by the US military. It means speaking out against global capitalism, where the resources are being utilized to enrich the minority rather than the majority. It means speaking out against and the consistent growth in our economies for degrowth to capital to tackle climate change and so on. And it means a struggle for women's rights, for gay rights and so on against that sort of narrow minded church dominated past that we had in Ireland, North and South. So to me, when we talk about a vision for a new Ireland, it has to compass all of those things and internationalism, a fight against neoliberalism, 
uh, and a fight against imperialism. But I do very much agree with the points that Colin made that we're moving into a space where these questions are going to be posed much more and therefore dialogues and meeting like this are incredibly welcome and I'm very grateful for being asked to participate. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Claire. That was um, uh, nothing less than uh, passionate and pretty comprehensive. Um, I think it's really refreshing actually to hear a passionate voice from the from the South uh, be heard in a, in a Northern uh, community like this. Um, there's a whole long list. It's almost like a charge sheet on the South uh, of all the things that has to get right before. Uh, um, that, and whether you agree with Claire's sort of general political or ideological um, um, sort of framing of the whole thing, there's, there's a whole bunch of things in there about the current state of the health service, uh, how you pay for the subvention. The, these are all a bunch of quite difficult challenges. It's not so much for people in the South, it's actually as the discourse from the South moves into the North, um, a lot of those people, and I thought your opening comment actually was a really telling one, that we need to think about whether um, a new Ireland is synonymous with the, a, a united Ireland. Um, and if it is, how 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 are we as a as a people going to make that a transformative change? So thanks very much for that, Claire. That was um, that was great, and I'm sure people will want to come back to you. Uh, Angela's got some questions there in the chat, uh, which uh, let me just say I'm not really sure who else in Europe Claire's referring to, and she says we should take ourselves off from the EU, but. Um, but she is dead against the militarization of the EU, which is mad, she says. So I want to come on to our third speaker. That's Tommy McCurney. Um, Tommy's probably best known as a uh, former hunger striker, but he's also been active in the trade union movement. And he's also uh, written a book on some of his own experiences, but framing it as around the provisional IRA from insurrection to parliament. And he writes regularly for the socialist voice. Tommy, I'm just going to, I'm going to throw it across to you without any preconditions. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Mike. Uh, yes, and uh, thanks to the host for inviting me on here. It's a auspicious occasion and 50 years since Bloody Sunday, which I remember with dread. I think when we're talking of a vision, you've got to be very hard-headed, clear-sighted. You have to make a very firm analysis of the concrete situation. Because if we don't, what we're hoping to make a vision could quick, quickly become more like a daydream. So we have got to look at the concrete situation, see how it's going to impact. And whether we like it or not, and I think there's an agreement with the speakers here this evening, that change is in the offing, that there is a constitutional movement, possible, highly likely, and in so many ways imminent, that the situation has changed post Brexit, but even before Brexit, there was a movement towards change. One of the significant factors, of course, is the demographics that are changing in the six counties. And while obviously there is a certain reluctance maybe to talk in terms of a sectarian headcount and it's not something that we're particularly tasteful to speak about. But having said that, it is one of the hard, cold facts of life in the six counties that will have an impact on the constitutional position, very likely. And the fact is that this dramatic change to the constitutional position on the island will not only impact on the north, but right across the island, it's going to make quite a lot of change to what we know on this island. The fact is that, again, we have got to recognise the fact that the changing demographics will produce a call for a referendum on partition. The fact that Sinn Féin has highlighted the issue and Claire has highlighted the fact that Sinn Féin has now 
a greater profile north and south than it had for many years. The fact that it has brought this issue in terms of a referendum on partition, the link with Britain, has brought it onto the agenda, high up onto the agenda, brought it centre stage, is certainly helpful to the extent that it is forcing this issue into the public space, into the public domain. And that's something that's incredibly important, incredibly important to have the issue spoken of openly, frankly, and transparently. The difficulty in some ways is that the Southern establishment, particularly the Southern government, certainly appears unwilling and reluctant to engage with this issue, in spite of the fact that, and it's strange for both myself and Claire Daly to be quoting Leo Varadkar, but Leo Varadkar spoke of the tectonic plates changing after the election of Sean Finucane in North Belfast some time ago. And that is actually a fact. The tectonic plates are changing in terms of the electoral makeup in the six counties. Dublin is, the Dublin government is reluctant to identify the need for a border poll for a referendum. The problem therefore is that while, and I accept Colin's point about civic discussion, the need for discussion, and obviously there's a need for discussion, but really that has to be promoted in so many ways by the wide, deep running state that is the Dublin government. Without that, and they are attempting to cover up, to postpone, if you like, to kick the can down the road as far as possible. They have their own selfish reasons in many ways for doing so. The fear perhaps that uh, inevitability of losing control if and when there's a new Ireland, if there was, and then to partition that the communities that now control would, would, would change. The fact is that I think there has to be pressure exerted on the Dublin government, the Dublin establishment, which has a very, if you like, carefully controlled narrative. We're seeing it at the moment with their narrative in terms of what's happening in Eastern Europe. It's a very one-sided interpretation of what's happening in the Ukraine, uh, but also they have a very one-sided narrative in terms of what's happening on this island. And they're trying to create a fear that if in the event of a referendum on partition or the ending of partition, that it will lead to endless violence. Now, if this discussion does not take place, if we don't have the time to talk about it, if we don't have the the realization that there is a coming an inevitability for a referendum, that it's almost guaranteeing a catastrophic outcome if this eventuality creeps up on us. The thing is that we have got to have this frank discussion and it has to be, in some ways, there has to be pressure put on the Dublin government to move away from this avoiding of the issue and make it very clear that one, that a border poll or a referendum on partition and the link with Britain is something that has to be contemplated, has to be something that has advocated, something that has to be endorsed. Otherwise, it leaves the situation in a vacuum. A vacuum is a very dangerous situation, particularly in the northern part of our island. We know from our history and we know from a very recent history what happens that we can't afford to allow that political vacuum to exist. There has been a change over the last number of years in the outlook of within the unionist community. Unionism remains obviously committed to the union, but we're seeing something that is no longer a monolith. We've got to engage with unionism, but it has to be done on the basis that change is coming, change will happen that it's not a question of not an inch, no surrender, that that's no longer a feasible situation. The situation has changed, of course, from the beginning of the 20th century when Britain was a large, powerful empire, when it had a strategic interest in keeping its military in the six counties uh, in order to control the island. Things have changed. The chances are that Britain will no longer wish to exercise the same influence 
it'll, sorry, it will wish to exercise influence, but not necessarily through occupation as it does at the moment. So points have to be made to need to be made in this situation. The discussion has to be held in a very clear headed, frank, honest way that change is coming, that it can't be postponed because of this reluctance to engage with the issues. And at such a stage then, when we're talking about the inevitability of change and change as it's happening will come one way or the other, that the change at that stage then will we we'll talk and allow ourselves to discuss how this change will come about. Will there be a transformative, transitional phase? How that would be engaged with, how we would deal with it? And secondly, what type of a new Ireland would we have? At that stage, this is where really we need to give and allow the discussion to negotiate the, the future, where we talk about the fears and concerns of the unionist population as such. We've got to ask them, and engage with them on an honest to goodness basis that in the event of change and with change coming, that what guarantees, what needs, what fears can be addressed and coped with, and what type of an Ireland will we have? How can we bring about a dispensation that will make the greatest number of people feel comfortable and give the maximum reassurance to unionists who are concerned? How do we guarantee that every citizen, and this is possibly very similar to what we've been covering before, but how do we guarantee that every citizen will have the entitlement to a house? A comprehensive national health service free at the point of entry. How do we provide adequate care for the elderly? How do we guarantee the centrality of labour? An end to coercive legislation and its practices. And that's something that's very important that we put an end to this concept of coercive legislation, which has been the being of this country for so long, coercive legislation, the idea, rather than have our citizens engage democratically, that our people are intimidated into following the desires to implement the will of the governing entity. In fact, without Emphasizing the point, that's exactly what was happening 50 years ago when the British state decided to crush what was a very democratic demand for civil rights with bloodshed in Derry on Bloody Sunday. But what we have to have is quite simply a different definition of citizenship in a new democracy. How do we bring that about? And that's one of the huge questions. But this will then bring us around to a point that Claire has made about our analysis of how we can, how can we do that? How do we implement such a program? Because that will entail and necessitate a thoroughgoing review of our economic strategy. Can we achieve housing for all, comprehensive health system, centrality of labour, care for the elderly, an end to privatisation, expansion of the social wage? Can we do all of those necessary things to bring about a new Ireland which would accommodate people, particularly the, those that are so concerned at the moment. But it's not, it's not something that's just addressing our unionist neighbours, but it's also the people of this entire island, particularly the working people of this island. Can we do that within the European Union, dedicated, as Claire has informed us, and rightly so, to neoliberal free market capitalism? And if not, where do we go from there? Because the fact about the European Union is that it's not something that can be cherry picked. It's not something that you can work on to accept the, 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 the critical engagement, those things that are in the interests of the Irish people to support and seek to further, and those things that are not to oppose and campaign for change. That is not an option. We cannot cherry pick the European Union. As we know that from the time of the bailout in 2010, that it was the big powers of France and Germany that dictated to Ireland that not only would they have to accept a cruelly impositioned bailout, but that it would also impose 
austerity. They may like to tell us now that austerity has ended, but it's still the same basic principle. We have to search to look beyond that capitalist straitjacket that is imposed by the European Union. Can we do it? Of course we can do it. We have the ability to do it. But those are some of the questions I think that we have got to pose to ourselves. But it's really a question of hard-headed reality. Change is coming. Change will be brought about. What we can't afford to do is let it creep up on us. We can't allow it to come without uh, thoroughgoing analysis, without conversations, without practical, pragmatic approach to this situation to negotiate the future that it comes as peacefully as possible. And we have to do it in such a way that it's not confined to isolated individuals. And I'm not in any way trying to undermine Collins' argument, but it has to, and I'm sure you would agree with me, it has to move beyond academia. It has to move beyond enclosed circles. It has to be, this has to be in many ways, practically the policy of the state of the Republic of Ireland, that it is encouraging, supportive of a transitionary to an all-Ireland, that it will be done with the support of the, the government to facil and facilitated by the government, that we've got to do it in such a way that there's no longer something that can be postponed just simply because there are vested interests opposed to it. It's hard-headed, it's practical, and it has to be brought about as an alternative. If we don't do it in such a way, the alternative is a catastrophic breakdown. We've had it before. This could be even worse. That if there isn't, if there isn't proper pre preparation, if there isn't encouragement, we've got to find, we've got to bring about a situation where in the event of a referendum on partition and the ending of the union, that that referendum, the result, and if it brings about a result to end it, that it's accepted. That it's accepted by the British government, that it's accepted by their agencies in the north, and that it's accepted and encouraged from Dublin. Otherwise, we're asking for, as I say, a catastrophic breakdown. Now, the point we can be blase about this, we can be realistic about it. But in the past, when we allowed the situation to, to not to be dealt with at a proper stage where we didn't deal with it. The unfortunate lesson of history is that relations break down irrevocably and the problem is that violence then becomes an option which is not to be encouraged or sought for but it has to be feared that if it happens that we don't have the proper control. So with that, I would suggest I'll stop. Thanks for that, Tommy. Um, um, very interesting. You, uh, you mentioned the whole thing about demographics. I think that's something we ought to really pursue a little bit further through the, uh, through the question and answer process. What does that mean? Where are we in terms of the, the relative standing of the two communities? How is that likely to be a driver for the kind of outcomes that you're particularly looking for. I also thought it was interesting, you, you, you said quite rightly that unionism, unionism is no longer a monolith and has to be engaged with. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really important point. It's a very important point for this particular forum to take on board because um, whilst the monolith implies greater weakness and fragmentation, it also perhaps is a greater challenge in terms of just exactly how you engage with that former monolith and the, the way that that's all beginning to break up. So before we go on to the Q&As, I just want to point out that originally this was supposed to be a five person uh, panel. Um, both um, Sinn Féin and the Alliance Party had uh, not only accepted the invitation, and confirmed that they were gonna come, but for reasons they haven't shared with the committee, um, have pulled out really, if not exactly at the last minute, certainly in the last week or so. So that leaves a bit of a gap here, particularly when we're thinking about the Alliance Party, because pretty much everyone who's spoken this evening has spoken very passionately and eloquently about their own feeling about 
you know, their positive feelings about the potential for a United Ireland at this stage. Uh, the moving on towards Colin said, that, you know, that we are the the operationalization of the, um, the the idea of the referendum. The University College London has done a huge study on this um, about under what conditions is it likely to take place what are the potential ramifications i think a lot of technocratic work has certainly been done about this but you know claire raises challenging issues about the current state of the republic and is this if you if you know if we were talking about diaries here if we were talking about you know <clears throat> how would you sell unification with the republic when uh, you know its whole economy has been been based on fdi really ever since uh, the the political economy paper from the Department of Finance back in 1959, which pretty much covers all my lifetime. Um, you know, there there are a whole bunch of things here that I think I, I'd like to hear the panel sort of uh, unpack in 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 greater detail. Um, so, uh, Colin, come, uh, let's see what have we got. We've uh, has anybody got a, got a question they want to. Uh, raise from the floor, so to speak. Otherwise, I, I just want to come to Colin and talk and ask him to really put some meat on the bones. There's one thing you did say, actually, that I thought was interesting. Maybe you can unpack it a little bit more. The academics at the moment are falling over themselves to do uh, projects on the whole sort of north-south thing. Um, what is that all about? What's driving it? And um, in your view, is it is it is it a helpful development, or is it is it kind of missing the point? Um, well, there's a few things I just want to pick up as, as well. What Claire and Tommy have said, just to elaborate. I don't want to, you know. Obviously, I'm an academic, so I would say that about academics, but. Like a lot of the work that Ireland's Future and myself and others have done is, is ex exactly what has been already said, to put the focus on citizens' engagement and participation in concrete terms. Like the, you, you know yourselves, the constant demand at the moment is that the Irish government establish an all-island citizens' assembly or some kind of all-island civic forum whereby people can get in the room to discuss these issues. Uh, for the life of me, I don't understand why the Irish government doesn't take that step. Although I do wonder, just noting the comments about Leo Varadkar and about what's likely to happen later this year, whether in, in an intriguing turn of events, Fine Gael end up becoming, a, a, taking ownership and leadership of this issue. It's notable, for example, not just Leo Varadkar, but also, you know, comments by Simon Horace, uh, Neil Richmond, never, not a day goes by without Neil Richmond making a comment about this. And I think that's interesting. So what to say, civic engagement, participation, absolutely essential. I agree entirely with the Irish government needing to show leadership. You know, at the moment, you know, what fascinates me is this process can be triggered from London. And you get people in Dublin will say to you, well, you know, it's the Secretary of State can trigger a border poll. And what a remarkable thing to say, because... British government could trigger a process that leads to transformational change in the island of Ireland. The Irish government's going to sit and wait, it, wait for it to unravel. Potentially a British government, as we know, not potentially, who simply cannot be trusted not to, you know, be tempted to go for this at a time at which people aren't ready as well. Let's uh, keep that in mind, you know. Um, uh, that's not completely beyond the bounds of reason. A few people have noted that, um, you know, looking at the polling now. Uh, but I just want to, so the Irish government needs to, this needs to be led from Ireland. Uh, Irish government needs to show a bit of leadership on it. And in open terms, there's, people aren't fooled by using alternative languages or alternative terminology. You know, the, the, the language of the agreement is United Ireland. Yes, we're using the language of New Ireland tonight. And I think the Irish government needs to just take it on and get on with it. Otherwise, they're being led from London on this issue, which is remarkable. But I just want to put something out there that I, I'm thinking about myself, right? And this just, I'm just intrigued by the EU component of it. Because I think there are colliding geopolitical interests happening at the moment that might explain some of the things we're seeing. Keep in mind that the Irish state is very, very uh, precious about its uh, membership of the single market and its relationship with the European Union. And the, what Brexit has done 
by removing the North, even with the protocol from the European Union, it's created a permanent headache for the Irish state, which risks, even with the protocol, which, as you know, what's happening around that at the moment, creates a sort of regulatory Wild West in the North that potentially in the longer term undermines Ireland's membership of the single market. So I think there's interesting geopolitical things going on around that, whereby people in the Irish system recognize that over the course of the next 10 to 15 years, um, that the um, fully taking on board the North may be in the pressing strategic interests of the Irish state in the context of its EU membership. In other words, bringing the entire European Union, the territory back into the European Union. So I'm just thinking about that out loud, right? So that's one. But there's a colliding strategic interest, and this may be just my academic imaginings, right? Brexit gives the British government, and particularly this Brexiteer government, a selfish strategic interest on the island. Because this Brexiteer government, in its ongoing battles with Brussels and the EU, now has a way of getting at Europe via the island of Ireland again. And you know, my view over the last couple of years, the British state, the British government has been deliberately and consciously destabilizing the North, not because it gives a whatever for the people of the North, but because it's a way of getting at the European Union as well. So there's an intriguing range of strategic uh, things going on, I think, to which uh, people here are, are, are essentially caught up in and are potentially collateral with, and all of it is sort of destabilizing um, what is going on now. But the big ticket one for me is, I increasingly think there's people within the Irish system, even if they may be skeptical about reunification, do see the geopolitical strategic value in bringing the entire island back within the European Union and really don't want to be in a situation where a British government can infinitum undermine uh, Ireland's membership of the European Union single market. And you've heard periodically uh, people in Europe float the idea, well, you know, where should this line be drawn? Uh, and I think there are a lot of people in the south of this island are very precious about that component of it. But that may be me just in my academic imaginings, thinking out loud. But it's just a way of saying I think there's multiplicity of factors at play, including the demographic, including the political, including the Brexit components that are all pointing towards us heading towards these referendums. And Mike, you referred to academic work. You know, if you're doing preparatory work, Again, you know, that's what academics do, right? They do evidence-based stuff, like research and things like that. So they give you the options, they give you the parameters for people to then decide. Okay, uh, look, I, I'm getting more questions for you, Colin, but I want to I want to uh, widen the conversation here. Um, Claire, there's a question here from Angela, which I um, want to throw at you. How do we include all the people who are mostly absent or excluded from these sorts of debates? Um, women, well, obviously you're here, so that's, but you know, you're politically engaged. I think, um, you know, the, the rest of the list is travelers, people of color, people with disabilities and so on. What efforts have the speakers been making to address the, that this exclusion and indeed the, um, the organizer of, uh, organizers of events like this? And I would add something else, which I'm sure Angela isn't thinking about, but there's, it's not just the population of unionism. What I've seen uh, over, over the last, since 2003 in the assembly elections, unionism has been going down. That was a peak when the UUP and the DUP were both fighting for dominance within that, within that camp. And of course, those intra-communal uh, fights mean that you maximize the number of people who are engaged, you maximize the number of votes and the number of seats, and it has been going down ever since. But um, is it four years ago, at the uh, maybe five years ago, at the, uh, the last assembly election in 2017, I was on uh, The Week in Politics, and a, and a graph was, was put up that showed that both the nationalist and the unionist vote is going down, and it's this new vote that's coming up in the middle that is ambidextrous or, you know, ambiguous. 
that's who we might have had, perhaps, if we'd had the alliance here tonight. But they're also mostly absent from these conversations, the people that you might be able to persuade to come across. So, uh, you know, that, that's not to move away from Angela's point about those people who are naturally excluded from these things. But basically, I, I suppose the principle is, how do you keep this from turning into an internal circle where people are just talking to the other members of the choir and not singing outwards, Claire? Thanks, Michael. And I, I know before that, Angela asked me another question. So I'm going to jump back up to that one first when she was saying that uh, I said that we should take uh, Ireland out of the EU and who were we going to join with? Uh, I didn't say that Ireland should leave the EU. Uh, I said I was very disappointed with the EU. But what I was trying to say really was that if Ireland and a uh, united Ireland or was going to meet the aspirations of the people who are, for example, rowing in behind Sinn Féin at the moment. Like that record popularity for Sinn Féin, as I said, doesn't to me reckon, re reconcile itself with a desire necessarily for United Ireland. It's very much about that idea of a new Ireland, of meeting the needs that haven't been met by our existing governments and Tommy referred to all of the issues that need to be addressed, our health service, the nature of jobs and so on and how are we going to, and the only point I was trying to make is that if a, an Ireland, a united Ireland or whatever is going to really meet the aspirations of people who are looking for change in a new Ireland, then it's going to have to break with neoliberalism and that is going to put you into a conflict with the European Union which is very much built and enshrined in the treaties, the concept of neoliberalism, of the markets and big business first. And you can't satisfy two markets. You can't meet the needs of people if you're going to be make, meeting the needs of uh, big business. And I think that does tie in with the, the question on the, chat, uh, on the chat is, how would Sinn Féin uh, in government North and South deliver on transformative change? And to me, it does involve a need to break with big business. I mean, would Sinn Féin in government, for example, tax the US multinationals as they should, given that the south of Ireland exists as, as a, a tax haven? Would they stop the US military using Shannon uh, and so on? So I see our future very much as part of a struggle of mobilizing the disenfranchised, and I'll deal with that at the moment, but there are many citizens across Europe who are let down by neoliberalism. So it's not a case of me saying, or we should leave the EU, but I think we should unite with all of the other disaffected Europeans whose needs are not being met by the EU's adherence to neoliberalism. We saw that with Greece, how much the people of Greece were let down and the, the EU's rules straightjacket economic policy. So in that sense, that issue needs to be tackled. But the other side of it is, and the reason why I mentioned it is, it is precisely because of a desire to maintain EU membership, then in some ways, this issue of a united Ireland is being posed more positively than ever before. And I think Colin's point is totally right, that the EU angle is very important and that you could see the South even looking at this and championing it as a means to keep our EU membership. That's how much they, they value it. So I think it, it's very much in play. But Angela's point about how do you um, mobilize the, the marginalized? And to me, that's precisely the point. Uh, it's the travelers, it's the women, it's the you know marginalized who have the most at stake in the idea of a better Ireland or a new Ireland. So you can only mobilize them by not just saying, oh, a united Ireland, because if I was a, you know, um, we'd say a person with disabilities in the north of Ireland, I'd look down at the south and go, well, Christ, I mean, things aren't really great down there either. If we're just going to unite with them, is that going to be any better? Not necessarily. I think we have to put these demands centre stage first and foremost, and then follow that with the, the need to break neoliberalism. I don't know if that's clear enough, but to me, we need to put those things first. And then out of that uh, comes the idea of, I suppose, joint action and, and a shared future. But to me, it, it all comes back to breaking the, the neoliberal economic stranglehold on our societies, because 
you can join the two halves. You can have a United Ireland, you can maintain your link, but un unless we're going to break that dominance, then I think the people who are the most vulnerable are going to continue to suffer. Uh, so I'm going to, thanks for that, Claire. I'm going to go to Tommy now. Uh, this is a, a question, um, I think, from Ronan. Um, and he says, I fear... Sorry, Mickey, you're not going to ask. You're not going to ask my question to the other two speakers. Why did you just ask the woman the question about diversity? Sorry, is that Angela? Yes, it is me. Sorry, uh, Angela, I've already featured, I think, uh, two or three. Yeah, no, I'm not, I asked a question about diversity, which you asked to one to the one woman in the group. Why did you do that? Oh, sorry. I'm trying to. I'm trying. To, I haven't had Tommy in yet, so I'm just trying to yeah, move no, the conversation but you, but you, on. You, but you, I would like you to ask that question to the other speakers. It isn't just a question that you well, just. Well, okay, be Angela. Let me put it this way, right? Okay, you've made your point. The, the panel, the panelists have heard. I, I, and when when I ask them another question, I will give them an opportunity to yeah. respond to that. And please question. don't think you know what I'm thinking either, Mick. Yeah, you made that point in the chat. Thanks yeah. very much. Well, you shouldn't have said that. Okay, uh, I'll go back to the question, thanks. So uh, I fear that as the conversation has been led to date by civic society, political power blocks and existing governments, that the reorganization of society on the island will be designed by the interests of those vested interests. I'm a manager in a local advice charity, which deals with over 3000 in inquiries each year in Derry and Straban. Poverty here is devastating. And there is a long overdue need for the reorganization of society in the interests of those currently with the least amount of power. Tommy, I'm coming to you really uh, as, as a trade unionist and someone who's involved, been involved in social activism. Uh, I, and I want you to focus on this question, but please do take account of what Angela sure. uh, has asked the rest of the panelists to take on board too. But I think there's a relationship between the two. Of course, of course. Look, and I see also that Stephen Gargan has asked the question, what should the role be for the trade union movement? The trade union movement, for whatever weaknesses it may have, and it has many, is the largest social civic body on this island with its membership. It reaches right down to the people. And the thing about it is that it has to be radical or it will become redundant. That's just the simple facts of it. It has the structures, it has the... Uh, it has the capacity to represent the, the class, and that's where it should be. That it, it, it's required. It, poverty is not an accident. It's not something that happens. It's not something that falls from the sky. Poverty is as a result of how the economy is uh, created, how it is structured, and how, how it happens. Economy, the, an, an economy is not either, is not an accident. It, the economy is built by people, and it's unfortunately at this point in time in this island of ours that it's built by those and created for the benefit of those wealthy and well off. And that's the res as a consequence of this, we have poverty. And it's not just, and I know your correspondent is not suggesting for a second that it's confined to Straban and Derry, but it's right across the island. We have poverty. We have 10,000 people almost homeless in the Republic of Ireland. There's many tens of thousands in rental accommodation that's stretching their budget to the limit. They're in poverty. Uh, heat or, or food is one of the questions so many are asking. And one, yes, we have got to ensure as best we can, it's something that every member of the trade union movement can engage in, to put pressure on, to reorganize, to support the class rather than just simply the, the membership of that particular union. And I'm fairly sure that given that type of mandate from the membership that there, there will not be a great resistance to it, but it has to be actively promoted and protected, that we're protecting the class, not just the local membership of, or, or the branch membership. But ultimately, we can only address poverty by changing the economic system. We've got to change the system. We've got to bring about, a, look, this, 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 is, this, this is not a new revelation. It's nothing new. We've talked about it since it's been talked about since, 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 since the beginning of time. James Connolly, as well as anybody else, has outlined what we need to do. We need to bring a workers' republic. We need to change the power in this society from those that have it at the moment to, to, to change the, the power base 
by changing the economic potential to, to, to transfer the hands of a few over into the hands of working people to remove poverty. It can be done and it has to be done. And certainly in terms of diversity, the need to engage with as many people as possible. We have so many new people, new Irish call, uh, people that have come on to here in the last 20 years, who in many cases are being excessively exploited through their labour. Uh, we have different constituencies and communities that have been overlooked, ignored, parked and set aside. There has to be an effort made to engage with as many people as possible. How we do it is a question that re requires a lot of thought, a lot of attention, because one of the points about this is that the narrative is too often dictated by the powerful. As I said earlier in the presentation, we are looking at the very tendentious reporting that's coming from RTE and BBC at the moment about what's happening in Eastern Europe, with very little concern for the fears, the, the real fear that has held within living memory in, in Russia of what has happened to them in the past, why they would be concerned about having a massive military complex parked near to their borders. Keep in mind that the eastern borders of, uh, of Ukraine is only a few miles, only a few, six hours from the city of Volgograd, which is otherwise known as Stalingrad. These are these things that are not being talked about in the wider context, but take it back to Ireland, we're talking here, where the, the narrative is dictated by the powerful self-interest. We've, we've got to challenge that narrative. How we do it is going to be something that we're going to have to give a lot of thought to. The thing is that at the moment, there are possibly means of doing so that had, didn't exist until recently. If we can use social media, if we can use the media that, for example, that the slogan it, it, has illustrated how it can be done. We've got to expand that, but we've got to look at how to do it. We've got to work on it and we've got to give mutual support. I think this is the point that we've got to support each other in terms of those that are the dispossessed. The old observation that when the rich come forward, the poor fall back, but we've got to ultimately depend on the men and women of no property. But we've got as men and women of no property, we've got to support each other rather than try to be in competition or something that we've got to, to do to bring the diversity into the centre. Thanks, Tommy. So, Colin, I just want to come back to you. Um, and can you pick up on that, that question, that question of inclusion, perhaps reflecting on your experiences with um, Ireland's future, because that's one of the most high profile uh, campaign. Um, organizations around this subject. So what efforts have organizations like that been making to make sure that those lesser heard voices, women, people of disability, people of color, uh, are coming into the center and having their voices heard? It's a great question. And um, I'm gonna give a rather boring answer to it in that, uh, you pay attention to how things are designed, right? I'll explain what I mean. Um, so we're talking tonight about processes that happen prior to these referendums and the substance of what's proposed. Well, you pay attention to, if you're organizing an event, how it's designed, and if you're organizing a citizen's assembly, how it's designed. And there's no point talking about equality and non-discrimination in the abstract if it isn't mainstreamed into everything that you do. And I think with many of these values, it's often about show, not tell. So Mick, the answer to that question is that, you know, equality, non-discrimination has to be mainstreamed into everything you do in terms of planning, whether that's an event, a citizen's assembly, or, you know, a constitutional convention, you know, you, you have to, pay due regard to all these values and what you do and just not talk about them in the abstract. However, I do want to highlight something that's probably worth pointing out, that a lot of civic movements now around this and our future and others, you know, keep in mind, are also involved in getting on with doing the work. And there's a consciousness there that not everybody will want to be involved in the design work of talking about and designing a United Ireland, quite rightly, 
because if you respect particularly political unionism, a political unionism will be getting on with the case of making the case for the union. And I think you have to respect that. But what you can do is you have a well-designed warm welcome for people to engage in the conversation. I want to pick up a second point about design and it relates to what Claire and Tom, Tommy have said. You know, what's driving this debate also on the island at the moment is a desire for socioeconomic change. And let's, let's not be in any doubt about that. You know, the issues that are, that are driving politics in the North and the South are about housing and healthcare and employment. They're about basic socioeconomic rights uh, that people are resolutely fed up, uh, haven't been realized. So the answer to that then is again, uh, a participation and design question. If people are talking about uh, a bill of rights or people are talking about a new constitution or that drafting work is starting, which I think some of it is uh, around some of this, then you have to make absolutely sure, A, that people are around that table, but that also people around that table are sympathetic to mainstreaming socioeconomic rights and socioeconomic justice right into the heart of this discussion in recognition of the fact that that is what's driving a lot of the dynamics on the island, north and south. A lot of the activists involved in this work don't see themselves in the old labels either, right? So in the, many activists involved in climate justice on the island, environmental change, social justice, um, are moving beyond some of the labels that we maybe grew up with, but they do see the, the wisdom of doing things on an all-island basis and promoting change on that basis. And then finally, in terms of design, you can have the loveliest constitution in the world. And many states around the world have lovely constitutions that when you look at them in the books, sound perfect, but they're meaningless in practice. And what we need to pay more attention to in this process now and in the future are institutional cultures, right? What I mean by that is you need to design processes that lead to institutional change um, in politics, public service, and in law. You know, whether that's how you make sure your fine words in a document are actually reflected in a policing service, for example, or whether your fine words on a page are, are, are reflected in your legal culture, your legal practice among your judges and lawyers, politicians and public service. Because you might have your fancy new Bill of Rights and your great fancy constitution, but if you're constantly meeting a blockage from public administration, civil servants, every institutional culture you meet, then those are going to be words on a page. So really, I'd like to underline, to underline tonight is paying attention, getting involved, but thinking about how you design stuff. And maybe this is just me being a boring, tedious, uh, academic lawyer type person is you need to think about how you design stuff that's going to achieve this social change. And if you're watching from afar or you're excluded, then it's hard to do that. But, you know. And that, that last point, I just want to underline again, one of the biggest problems with some of these laws is they always face off against institutional cultures that are resistant to change. So one of the things we need to think about this island is not just getting these rights in documents, but how do we overcome institutional cultures, north and south, that are profoundly resistant to equality, human rights, social and climate justice. Great, thanks, Colin. Um, there's a, there's a question here from Stephen for Claire and I think you're the only one who can really give us a, a, a sort of a, a, a knowledgeable answer on it. How is the idea of United Ireland viewed in Europe and will they be proactive on this question as the debate builds? Sorry Claire, did you get that? Sorry, Michael, I couldn't fully hear you on that. And I don't see that question in the chat. It was something about Europe and the United Ireland. I'm trying to look for it in the chat and I can't see it. Uh, yeah, how is the, uh, Stephen, it's not far up. Um, how is the idea of a United Ireland viewed in Europe? And will they be proactive on this question as the debate builds? Whew, uh, how big is your crystal ball on that? Um, <laughs> Look, I mean, I think the European Union is pretty practical on these things. The Southern government would have made a huge play about how Europe was our friend. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that that is necessarily the case, but it was in Europe's strategic interest, if you like, to stand behind the, the South in the, in the Brexit row. 
would that morph into championing the idea of a united Ireland? That's not generally a space that the European Union would go to. Uh, at the moment, they're probably still in a place where they're quite cross post-Brexit. Uh, they feel bad about that. They didn't want to make the departure easy because they didn't want to encourage other people to follow suit. Um, but would that morph into sort of championing a united Ireland? I, I think they would probably be yeah, I mean, they'd be open to it, um, but I don't think we should rely on them to, to fight our battles for us or, or anything in, in that regard either, you know. Um, I don't know if that fully answers the question. I didn't get all of it and I still can't see it in the chat, but um, yeah. No, I think that's that's great, Claire. Thanks. Um, the one for Tommy now, and I've got I've got a fine, well, a, another one uh, coming for Colin, which, which I think maybe all three of you could have a go at. Um, and it's, um, I can't see directly who it's from, but uh, given the Good Friday Agreement has been the architecture for the debates to date, does the panel feel that there are any inherent dangers in that? I, the GFA talks about the totality of relationships, I North, South, East, West, and could that mean under any, any new Ireland under the architecture of the Good, uh, the, the Good Friday Agreement will have British government interference in any event, and how, if ever, so could such interference be curtailed to allow transformative social change or reorganisation of the use of its resources? Slightly crystal ball uh, question as well, Tommy, but but a, but a very interesting one nonetheless. Yes, of course. I think you have to keep in mind that uh, what we're talking about with a New Ireland also as a sovereign people. And it's not a question of what necessarily the British want or what the British intend to do. The Good Friday Agreement was in many ways a peace treaty to bring an end to the years of conflict. And it, it, it did outline a process. But having said that, there's nothing here cast in stone. A lot of these issues are just what the people will decide for themselves. And if we have a sovereign people, that will exclude interference from Britain. Otherwise, the point is that there are elements within the on the island, and I'm not talking about unions, I'm talking about sort of the Southern Irish establishment who, for their own narrow reasons, wish to have a, a connection, a safeguard uh, with, with Britain to, to, to in strengthen their position in, in terms of their financial position, in terms of their social position. But having said that, if we can bring about this qualitatively new Ireland that we're talking about, one where people have sovereignty to deliver, where people have the sovereignty to deliver on the issues that matter, that's the issues around the social and economic, particularly the issues that we've outlined, the three of us have outlined here, that we can only do that within a sovereign, sovereign Ireland with a sovereign people. And at that stage then, that by definition, that excludes interference, not just from Britain, but from the imperialist interests in the United States, the imperial interests that 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 motivate so much of European Union's foreign policy. That is, the question here is how do we deliver on having a sovereign people that take the decisions for themselves rather than allow interference from outside? Good Friday Agreement is only so good as people are willing to in, enforce it or allow it to happen, and it's 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 a question of what we wish to do as a people, as a sovereign people. Thanks, Tommy. Uh, this one is aimed at you, um, Colin, but I think everyone probably has an opinion on it. What can we learn from the Scottish experience and what will the British government's position uh, be in the growing debate? Will they resist change? I, the unification process itself, like they have done in Scotland thus far. Interesting question. So uh, we have all thoughts on this. I just want to um, double back a bit on the um, question about Britain and just pose this question back to, to the audience. Um, in the decade ahead, what will Britain even mean? Yeah. So when we talk about British government, the British state, what will that even mean in a context where Scotland is likely to go its own way, Wales is thinking about it, uh, England might go its own way first, obviously English nationalism is driving, 
uh, much of this uh, at the moment as well. We have to acknowledge that. But I really want to frame it in a different way. Like, if you're an internationalist, right, and you believe that we're globally connected, um, then first of all, we want good relationships across these islands into the future. We don't want to be sealed off from the rest of the world, and that includes relationships across these islands. And one of the strengths to me in the Good Friday Agreement is that it does think in relational terms, not just about this island, but about these islands as well. And the British Irish Intergovernmental Conference, you know, if that provides a forum for both governments on the basis of equality to talk to each other, then why not? You know, remember it was historically unionists in the north protesting against the Irish government having a role in the north. Well, you know, if we're, if there's going to be a welcome for Ulster British unionists in the United Ireland, then we should be talking up in some ways the fact that there will be relationships. There'll be a British Irish Council still, and it seems to me a good idea that all the democratic institutions around these islands, including the Scottish government, Scottish Parliament, whether that's independent or whatever happens next, that we're talking to each other. So I just want to make a, a plea for, yes, the argument is about a new Ireland and a new United Ireland, but you know, having good relationships with your neighbours seems to me sensible, particularly from an internationalist perspective as well. And it links on to the next point. You know, we can learn from Scotland. You know, there's things happening in Scotland in relation to how the Scottish government and parliament uh, handled the referendum. You know, it, it's ad nauseum now, but we all know they produced a fairly comprehensive document, a proposal for independence. It didn't work out the first time round, probably will the next time round, but um, I think we could learn from that, that uh, we are very, very clear with people what voting for a new United Ireland will actually mean. And that's what I mean by doing the work in advance, that we have a document like that, that sketches out both substance and process. What I mean by process is there's some things that won't be decided in advance, but be decided afterwards. And I don't need to tell this audience, a united Ireland, a new Ireland won't be a sort of big bang, one-off event that we wake up in. There'll be a managed transition over time. And sort of struggles for social justice don't stop. You know, you don't give up and go home. You know, in a united Ireland, struggles for equality, rights, social justice, whatever, they will continue and they'll go on. And it, it won't necessarily be utopia, but we could learn from Scotland in preparing the ground in making the case, having concrete proposals. And another thing we could learn from Scotland is the Scottish government have put a very strong emphasis on human rights in their proposals. In fact, they've really tried to push the envelope in Scotland in terms of equality and rights in the way that they do government. So I think there's lessons there as well. In it was clear from the recommendations they made that they were proposing to, to hardwire these in to independent Scotland in a meaningful way. And I think, again, there's lessons to be uh, learned uh, from uh, Scotland. And, you know, just to end that, you know, there's a tendency to talk about worry and fears and threats. And, you know, I, I gave a presentation recently where I gave a detailed presentation for 45 minutes on the bloody EU and Irish unity. And the first question person asked me was, what about loyalist violence? And I, I thought, I thought to myself, you know, this is a remarkable period of time we're living in, potentially, where we're on the precipice of potentially uh, exciting change on the island, where we get to be involved and shape this. So, you know, while I, I'm not naive or stupid, I do know our past and I do know the potential that is there. I do actually think that on this island and across these islands, there's a basis for building coalitions, including trade union movement, to support each other in the change processes that are going to be happening in a decade or more ahead. Thanks, Colin. And Claire, I'm just going to throw those two loosely over to you. So Scotland and uh, the long abiding influence in Britain post uh, a successful referendum. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's very unfair to me to ask me to uh, follow up on, on Colin's very excellent summary there, because I have to say I do uh, 
agree with you, you know. I mean, what we're talking about here is, um, I suppose, a really positive juncture where we have the opportunity to have a, a conversation and exercise a sort of a, a debate and a movement towards uh, a new Ireland. And, and like that's the frame of the discussion here. And it is about, you know, social justice. It is about recognizing the rights of minorities and so on. Um, and that should be a space for everybody. So I, I think there's a huge positive. I mean, we can't divorce it from what's gone on with Brexit, from the disunited United Kingdom. We're not talking about the same uh, British forces as before. All of those points, I mean, Colin made them excellently. I can't really add to that. You know, we should see this as something where we can positively move things forward. And I, I think the Scottish example is, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I suppose we can learn from it, but we can also add to it, you know. Great. So um, I'm thinking now, I think we've run through most of the questions, um, Stephen. I hope I haven't missed anybody out. Um, so if I could just ask, um, starting, going in reverse order, maybe asking Tommy, first of all, just to give us some um, of your concluding remarks your thoughts on maybe some of the questions and the comments of fellow panelists, um, Tommy. Okay, I just maybe comment about the Scottish situation and it's something that strikes me that I think a lady who deserves a lot of credit for what's happening in Scotland at the moment is the late Margaret Thatcher, whose assault on the Scottish economy has alienated so many in Scotland. I think maybe the economic situation has an impact not only in Scotland, but it may well impact on us as well. I think it's something that we've got to give the late Mrs. Thatcher some credit for is, uh, is the breakup of the United Kingdom. But uh, I'll, I'll end very briefly here on a quick note with a new, uh, if we're talking about a new Ireland, and I, I'll maybe just quote one of our old heroes, James Connolly, when he said, the Irish Republic must be a word to conjure with, a rallying point for the disaffected, a haven for the oppressed, a point of departure for the socialist enthusiastic in the cause of human freedom. And I think that's just how I'd like to end this conversation. Thanks, Tommy. Claire? No, I, I like Tommy's conclusion. I mean, for me, we can't divorce the question of the struggle and the vision for a new Ireland. And we can't separate that from the socioeconomic issues. I mean, for me, they are the key reasons why we see Sinn Féin riding high in the polls. It's that desire for something different and all of the problems faced by our citizens north and south, the challenge of climate change, all of the problems suffered by women, by people with disabilities and so on. It's an aspiration for something different and, and, and something better. And I think if we put those issues center stage that we try and challenge neoliberalism, which is a block to a lot of these, then I think the path is certainly unlocking that we can have uh, that conversation. And in that, we can be a beacon for the rest of the citizens of Europe who are equally disenfranchised from the ruling elites in, in their societies as well. So I think it's been really uh, an interesting discussion and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody uh, on Sunday. So thanks so much for allowing me to participate now. Thanks, Claire. Um, so, Colin, um, I'm going to ask you to uh, to make your remarks. There is also another question there, a response to your last, but one point I think. But um, uh, and you can you can address that in your final comments or not. It's up to you. Everybody can see that can you, in the chat. Can Can you see the question? I can't see it. If I could, I just. Oh yeah. In response to Colin. Yeah. There's a big difference between having good relationships with your neighbour and the neighbour having hardwired political interference in your affairs. If a future internationalist progressive, socially minded Ireland seeks to break away and free from re reactionary forms of government, evident in Britain and the output of, the, of English nationalism, do we not need to ensure that such a hardwired scenario does not come to pass? Yeah. Just to answer that you know, quickly, um, Yes, in a sense, you, but we're talking about uh, relationships that go beyond um, political parties and governments, you know what I mean? The peoples of these islands, there are also connections and relationships there. Um, and it's about uh, 
meeting and in dialogue on the basis of equality and the basis of respect. It doesn't mean accepting, you know, uh, English nationalism. It doesn't mean accepting appalling governments in London. It just all, all I'm really saying is that, that that whether we like it or not, we're going to have to have relationships across these islands. And if we can bring our neighbours back onto the right path when they've ventured way, way off, and we can help them and guide them back to a socially progressive future, then why would we miss that opportunity, you know? Um, and, and my goodness, they could use some help at the moment. Uh, they really are very far off the path. Um, so just, just to, 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 and, and ultimately, if we're internationalists and we're globalists, that's what we're about, right? We're not, we're not just interested in changing Ireland. We want to change the world, yeah. And that includes on the way our nearest neighbor who happens to seems to have lost the plot at the moment. Uh, so just to, by way of, of ending, um, I just want to make a plea this evening, first of all, to thank you for inviting me. And I'm delighted to, to be here. Uh, I don't see this as a one-off event. And if you have any questions about what I've said or you'd like to talk further, or I've put you off forever and you never want to see me again, uh, get in the queue for that. Um, just please get in touch beyond tonight. I'm happy to, to talk further. But I want to make a plea to you all, and I would say this to anyone, really to try and find ways to work together and collaborate. Because one, one of the most disheartening things I often find, particularly among progressive movements, is a capacity to fall out with each other. And I would just make a plea that in this conversation and the work that people are doing in the future, and I say this to myself and, and a wide range of groups as well, to find ways to work together, to collaborate, to build coalitions, to start your own civic processes. Don't wait for other people. Uh, you don't need permission to do it. Uh, have your own, you know, where you can. And I realize that resources are a problem. My own view on this is we're now on the final stages. I, I, I used a rather um, uh, challenging analogy around a marathon the other day, which is we're in the sort of last five or six miles. I genuinely think that. I think the island is heading towards reunification. I think we're in the final stages of that process. We want it to be a well-managed process that learns the mistakes, the many mistakes that everyone has made in the past, and that we make sure we don't hurt each other in terms of where we're going next. But just make an, a plea to all of you. Look, there, there's stuff flying around at the moment. There's been worse in the past, a lot worse, right? Key thing is don't be distracted by it. Don't be derailed by it. I don't let people who thrive on promoting division and stability here uh, uh, triumph. But yes, th th there's going to be turbulence and it may be difficult and we may be heading into a challenging and difficult period of time. But my sense is it'll be nothing like what this uh, region uh, and this island has faced in the past. And I've just urged people to keep pressing on. Uh, I will be, and I'll be working with other people to do the same and to try and manage this as responsibly as possible and take care of each other and make sure everybody emerges safe and well on the other end. And just end really by saying, look, look at your title. Um, it's a new Ireland, uh, the clues in the title. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks, Colin. And I was searching around to trying to think how could I finish this with a, with a good quote that sort of tries to encapsulate at least the spirit of the conversation and uh, up on pops. Jim Keyes with the perfect one, which is the inscription from the monument in Rossville Street, which reads, their, appetite, their epitaph is in the continuing struggle for democracy. Uh, democracy is built of conversation about the meaning of minds, the separating of minds. And as I said at the beginning, it's about, um, it, it's, it, it's about using language to find new ideas that reframe some of the old, some of the old issues. And I think Colin certainly opened a few doors for us there. Claire's given us a very valuable perspective from the South. And thanks, Tommy, for uh, for that sort of um, trade union kind of socialist Republican sort of view on it. I have many questions myself, which I haven't had time to ask this evening, because for me, it's important that the audience get their say. Uh, but um, Thanks very much for all of you uh, coming this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it and um, I hope you'll continue to engage with other events around the weekend. Thank you.